Welcome everyone to uh, this talk by Professor Nate Holtman on achieving the Paris Climate Goals, the engine of ambition. And I just wanted to say a few words about Nate um, to introduce him. He is uh, the director of the Center for Global Sustainability and an associate professor at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. He is also an associate director of the Joint Global Change Research Institute, which is a collaboration between the University of Maryland and the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. From 2014 to 2016, Professor Holtman worked at the White House in the Obama administration's climate, uh, on the Obama administration's climate and energy policy team. And during this time, he'd helped develop the US 2025 climate target. He worked on U.S. bilateral engagements with various nations, including China, India, Brazil, and others, and also participated in the international climate negotiations, the COP meetings in, Li in Lima and also in uh, Paris, and also in the run-up to those meetings. His research focuses on national climate target setting and assessment, U.S. emissions mitigation policy, energy technology transitions in emerging economies, and international climate policy. And he has participated in the U.N. climate process since the Kyoto meeting. He's also a contributing author to the I IPCC Fifth Assessment Report and Special Report on Renewable Energy. And he teaches courses on climate change policy and energy policy. Professor Holtman was also formerly a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, a visiting fellow at Oxford, and um, also worked for a while at Georgetown University. He holds an MS and a PhD in Energy and Resources from the University of California, Berkeley, and a BA in Physics. And I'm delighted to have Professor Holtman here for a number of reasons, and one is that um, I really enjoy several aspects of his work, and one aspect I just wanted to highlight is that Nate and Nate's work really shows um, a combination of both a scientist sensibility, I would say, but also a keen sense of the real world constraints that are faced in real world policy making. And I think this is one of the reasons that he has been so influential and also exceptionally effective as both a researcher and a practitioner in the area of energy and climate policy. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Holtman. Thank you so much, uh, Jessica, uh, for, for that uh, kind introduction and uh, also for uh, in, uh, inviting me here. And also thanks to the MIT Energy Initiative. It's uh, Frankly, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I've, I've worked in the kind of energy um, field, if we have one, uh, for a long time. And uh, of course, this is a, a, a great program. And, and it's a wonderful opportunity to have a chance to share some ideas with you all. Um, I've had some opportunities to speak with a number of people here in the audience during the day. And I was joking with Jessica, it's a little bit like a, a, a job interview, but without the stress. So I can enjoy all the learning from, from our various meetings and, and hearing about all the interesting work that that people are doing here. Um, and it's really just been an energizing, uh, no pun intended, but energizing experience to, to be here and being able to interact with you all. Um, so let's, let's take a look at, at, at this first slide. Now, um, as Jessica mentioned, the, uh, uh, I, I've been sort of doing this, this international climate stuff for, for a number of years. Um, and I think that we are now um, at an inflection point in the global approach uh, to climate change. Uh, globally, there's widespread acknowledgement in the science of climate change. Uh, we also are at a point where we understand and we can see that energy technology costs are dropping uh, and have dropped because of actions that have been taken over past decades, have dropped to points where they are often competitive or even in some cases cheaper than the competing uh, dirtier technologies. Um, so there are some pieces that are coming together and there's an attitude shift globally, if not maybe all uh, in all parts of uh, the United States, about the importance of addressing the, the climate issue and also the, uh, the potential process by which uh, we might do that. Um, this picture is showing a, a, a sort of a, a person uh, in, in an island state called Kiribati. Um, and I put this on, I'll, I'll put several of these up over the course of the talk. The most recent climate negotiations this past November um, which uh, uh, Jessica was at and presented at, and maybe some of you all 
also attended um, and, and uh, participated in in some way. Um, the island nation of Fiji served as the presidency of, this, of, of these talks for the first time. This was an island state leading it, even though it was held in Germany. Um, and the spirit of those uh, uh, conversations was constructive, uh, despite the Trump pullout from Paris. Uh, the focus was on implementing the next steps of the Paris Agreement and on um, thinking about what the next uh, 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 steps would be globally uh, for looking to advance ambition uh, under that process. Um, so this uh, particular photo is this is there was a group that were submitted as part of the COP, a part of the climate conference. This is uh, this is one of them. Um, and I, I, I raise this, I bring this up because, um, first of all, this is not going to be a talk about climate science. Uh, so this is a talk about the process that we're engaging in uh, to address the climate issue. And um, of course, there's a human side of this issue. Uh, there's a science side of this issue. There's a number of dimensions to the issue. All, many of you, probably most of you, or all of you, have been working in some form or another uh, with this. Um, but uh, it did make me think, as I was um, preparing the talk today, um, it made me realize that today is December 12th, 2017. And the first meeting Jessica mentioned, the first meeting that I went to in this international climate world was uh, the Kyoto meeting in 1997. So it turns out that was concluding December 10th of 1997, which of course caused me some, some opportunities to reflect and say, what has happened over this 20 years? And um, while I can say that uh, I still have, uh, I, in fact, I will be talking about the fact that I have some optimism about where we're going, um, the fact that it took us 20 years to get here is, is a bit of a, a concern, but I'll address that uh, throughout the talk. So even though I'm not talking about science, I, I do want to mention that, um, I do want to sort of show you this one uh, slide, which I think encapsulates about as much as I want to say today about um, the warming that we're seeing. Um, I want to kind of use this as a way to remind us that we're dealing with something that is scientific, scientifically grounded, empirically understood, um, and uh, a very high confidence that, we're, uh, that we are doing uh, damage even now uh, and having risks to our human societies because of climate change. Um, I was reminded of this uh, a speech that was given at the Kyoto meeting by, at that point, the president of, of Nauru named Kinza Klodumar. Um, and I remember actually sitting there watching the screens. This was the talk right before Al Gore's talk, but it, it, that was the one I remembered. I remember Al Gore's talk also, but, but this was the one I remembered, and it was, it was quite powerful. And he said, the willful destruction of entire countries and cultures with foreknowledge would represent an unspeakable crime against humanity. No nation has a right to place its own misconstrued national interest before the physical and cultural survival of entire countries. The crime is no less when it is perpetrated slowly by the emission of invisible gases. We are trapped, a wasteland at our back and at our front, a terrifying flood of biblical proportions, and our plight is not unique. Um, so I think that as we're thinking about this particular example that I gave, I gave one example of one population that's threatened by climate change. I gave one example of some science of, of, of the warming of climate change that we know empirically that this is happening and we'll, we're confident it will continue to happen. Um, you all know more, there's more to the story than that, but let's just remember those two things as we're thinking about this process and the importance of why we need to do this, why we need to get it right this time, and, and how we might go about doing that. And in this context, I, I, do, I am convinced that we have a, an excellent opportunity with the Paris Agreement. Um, the Paris Agreement provides us a process for getting the ambition that we need to address climate change, um, but there's a challenge that's embedded in it, and that challenge is what I'm, I'm gonna be talking about uh, today. So the challenge of the Paris Agreement is that it sets up a process by which countries will report their targets, they'll, they'll do a number of things that are required by Paris, but in order to do that, we are going to need new models for how we as researchers, how we as institutions of uh, research and learning, and how we as universities do engage with this process. And that's, uh, that's what I will, will turn to next. So let's start with the basic premise of Paris, which was under development for some time. We, we know, I, I mentioned before, the Kyoto Protocol. Well, the Kyoto Protocol was, in the end, largely unsuccessful. It did some things, but the core element of, of Kyoto really, really didn't work. Um, Paris itself was a response to the failures of, of Kyoto, and I think effectively uh, responded and addressed to those, or will well, I believe it will be effective, but uh, it, it should at least address some of the weaknesses uh, that, that arose uh, during the Kyoto Protocol. Um, so the innovation of Paris is this 
um, core ambition mechanism that I mentioned earlier where the countries have to kind of think about what they can do in internally and then report out to the international community. What does this ambition platform, as I call it, look like under the Paris Agreement? Well, first of all, there's, there's um, a, a, a reiteration of a previous commitment that had been made a few years earlier to set a global goal of a two degree Celsius pathway. So in other words, keeping global warming below two degrees Celsius uh, uh, compared to pre-industrial times. And then Paris added this additional and more, more highly ambitious uh, uh, target of saying with best efforts uh, to get to 1.5, which is, uh, it's hard to get to two, uh, it's even harder to get to 1.5. Another element that's in the Paris Agreement is the periodic national target setting of so-called nationally determined contributions. And this is the, when Jessica introduced me, uh, this is one of the elements that I worked on in the context uh, of the United States. Each country has a process under Paris that will then develop a target, a national target, that then they will uh, report out to the international community. That's the second piece of the ambition platform in the Paris Agreement. A third element that's in the Paris Agreement is not only the shorter term targets, say to 2025 or 2030, but also to ask countries to think about their longer term strategy for long term low carbon development. In other words, long term decarbonization. Uh, globally, we know we have to hit rate, um, re uh, reductions of almost 50% or more, depending on how you think about it, by the mid century and, and probably 80, 90, or even higher than that by the end of the century. Uh, but so how countries do that and how they think through their pathway is an important part of a national strategy. And again, Paris actually calls the question of asking countries to deliver something to the international community about this long-term strategy. A fourth element is, this, um, is an idea that it's not only kind of goal setting, but also the ability to track how countries are performing over time. And that involves countries sharing information, making reports out of where they are, where they expect to be. And, endeavoring to be transparent about their anticipated reductions as well as what they anticipate and in fact are doing even today to get there. And finally, um, there's a periodic assessment of the aggregate ambition. So all, some of these are individual countries that are responsible for doing their thing in their own country, but of course, the science requires us to understand what's being done globally, because the atmosphere cares about global emissions. It doesn't care about what individual jurisdictions do. So there's an, an, uh, there's an engagement to think about periodically as a global community what the individual contributions are doing to lead us on the path, what, you know, whether we're on the path to two degrees or whether we're on the path uh, to 1.5, that's built into the process. Okay, so it's not just an IPCC process, it's actually a broader uh, political process. So I use the term in the title, the engine of ambition, and I have to say this, I'm not sure that that's uniquely my term. I've heard it from a couple of people. I give a colleague of mine, Greg Carlock, some, some credit for raising that in my mind, so I want to, want to say it's not my own term, I don't own it, but I like the term. Uh, other than the fact that you imagine that it, most engines are run on fossil fuels, um, the engine of ambition is the idea that Paris sets up a process that can actually help create the, the situation where ambition can be, more ambition can be possible in the future. Um, so there's a number of steps of this, and I'll run through them very briefly because I, I think that they're more or less self-explanatory, but the first element, if you think about this, I'm gonna write it, I'm gonna do this in a circle and you'll see that it'll all come back to the beginning, but at some point you gotta start thinking about what can you do? How much can you reduce as a country? You know, what are your, op what are your highest sort of opportunities for abatement? And what are the kind of lowest marginal abatement cost opportunities that you can squeeze out? Sometimes it might be the case that you can do more in higher cost opportunities than you can do in low cost opportunities. That, that's sometimes the case, for example, historically in transportation. Sometimes we in the US have been able to do more in those areas than we've been able to do in, say, electricity. It's just what, how we've had it. And so you'd have to think about what, what are the policy tools we have? How might we able, be able to kind of press on those options to get something done in the near term? Okay, that's scoping. Another, a second process, once you've actually thought about it, is to think about, well, what can we do if we aggregate all these opportunities together? This is, again, Paris asks countries to say, what can you do? With the goal of saying, look, if countries are all like sort of holding hands together and stepping forward, you want to be sure that you're, the countries right and, right and left of you are also doing something. So thinking about what those targets are and how to, to, to communicate them is a second uh, big sort of element to this process. Of course, you have to implement those targets, and that's a problem. Sometimes, sometimes countries haven't completely thought through how they might do things. They kind of say, okay, we're gonna do 20% by this year uh, based on some inputs that they've gotten from 
somebody at some point, but they might not have thought through concretely and carefully what they have to do this year, next year, the year after that in order to actually start pushing on those policy levers to get the, the broader economy to actually respond. Um, that's the stage we're at right now with respect to a lot of the targets that were set before Paris. There's a kind of scramble to understand how do we do implementation across a diversity of national circumstances. Um, a fourth element is, is, is collecting data. This is really one that's not linearly only in one spot. It's really kind of all over, but I put it in one spot just because I had to put it somewhere. Uh, but you collect data and you report out on data. Okay, So that's a part of how other countries, as well as people within a single country, will understand how well we're doing and how well they're doing. Because that's part of the idea. If you can sort of set a target, provide evidence that, that you're making progress toward the target, you raise confidence in the process, and you encourage future ambition. And finally, um, there's a review and discuss part of the process, where countries do get together. There is a kind of a mutual assessment of how well they're doing. Of course, in some cases, countries will say, oh, we couldn't do it because of reason x and y. And the other countries will sort of nod their head and say, yes, we understand. We also couldn't do it because of x and y. And what we're hoping is that the, the x's and y's don't add up to be too much. right? There, there, there might be some reasons that countries couldn't deliver this or that, but that overall they're sort of on track to hit their targets. So this is what I call this, this NDC process. And why do I call it the engine of ambition? Well, if you continue to do this over time, the idea of Paris is that you build confidence uh, if countries can do this, implement and deliver, and then other, it's transparent that they're delivering, you can sort of create the conditions for a next round of success. right? And then you do the next round successfully, and then you can do it again. Um, let's see if I can. There we go. And then so, so as part of this, the governments have to report out. That's, that's kind of a key element of this that I mentioned before. There's this reporting and transparency element of it. That is not the right graphic. Uh, this has happened to me before. It's actually the right graphic, but it's the wrong crop of it. So um, let me see if I can uh, just voice over this. Um, so this is from a report that's actually called Revolution Now from the Department of Energy that uh, some of you may have seen before. Um, the, the interesting um, piece of this that I remember the last slide was this engine of ambition. And, and the, the logic of this is that um, over time, as, as countries implement their targets, they will continue to deploy Let's take, for one example, clean energy technologies of the form, perhaps, of solar or wind or something like this. And as actually many people in the room have probably studied in some form or other, the more you deploy, the more you can drive down costs. So what we've seen in the last you know, seven or eight years is that costs have dropped, uh, in fact, much more than we had expected five or seven years ago they would. Um, Clean energy costs overall have dropped something like 40 to 90 percent uh, between 2008 and 2014 or 2015. Uh, some of them, of course, dropping more rapidly because they were kind of earlier stage technologies like LEDs. Um, others dropping a little less rapidly, but still 40 percent roughly drop in wind technology costs over that time, 60 percent in solar. Um, the point there being that this process has been observed happening already, and with continued deployment of technologies, we expect it to continue. And, and Jessica actually herself has done some, and her lab has done some work uh, on this particular question. So this is what I uh, talk about with the, th this idea of engine of ambition, that this deployment enables higher future ambition if you kind of imagine this cycle continuing over time. And this is my attempt at, at, at sort of showing you what this would look like over time as you're doing this uh, over and over. Imagine it in three dimensions rather than two. Um, but that over time, the cycle of ambition is continuing to, to ratchet up and, and that we continue to uh, deploy technologies at lower cost in the future at, lower, um, at, at higher volumes. OK, so I'm going to skip over that. So um, this is actually a. If, if, if I'd had the right graphic sort of showing up here, this is a, a, a piece that Jessica actually worked on a couple of years ago. As I, as I was at White House, we were in contact uh, with this lab as well as uh, other places around the country. But, but Jessica's group did some nice work on thinking through what deployment of these technologies would, would imply for future energy technology costs. And I think that's something that we have to kind of uh, continue to remember as we're, we're thinking about this. OK, so that's the cycle of ambition. That's the kind of how we imagine this process working. And that's kind of the ideal uh, way that this would, would evolve over time. And the Paris Agreement sort of sets us up with some specific texts and some specific 
moments in time where there's agreement that countries will deliver this or deliver that uh, in order to keep that uh, cycle going. For example, the national target settings every five years. And then there's a kind of assessment or a stock take um, a couple of years after that each, uh, each cycle. But with this, this set of innovations, or I should say with this set of um, uh, this process that's set up, um, it sets up a, what, what I will, will claim is a new relationship between research and policymaking. Um, many, many of us who've worked in the, some kind of field relating to the science policy or the technology and policy interface are familiar with the, frankly, decades of work that's gone into thinking about how do we make better policies that are informed well by science or how do we make better policies that take you know, that, is, that take the proper consideration of existing technologies um, in terms of how they sort of target doing uh, a specific deployment strategy or doing a specific um, sort of economic plan. Um, the Paris Agreement creates a different kind of dynamic. Previously, a lot of what happened with um, policies in climate change has been that there have been a lot of scientists or a lot of people that work on technology, and they would sort of come up with some ideas. They would try to convince their national governments, we should do this, we should do that. They would work, of course, across the spectrum of stakeholders, work with NGOs, work with others, to say, here's a policy we should do. Here's a strategy we should take. And that, of course, does, you know, that's the kind of standard, and that's, to some degree, you have to work in that world. That's, that's how, how things often are. But the opportunity here is the Paris Agreement creates a different dynamic. It actually puts countries on the hook to think about these five elements of that ambition platform that I mentioned earlier, right? The countries have to put together a target. That means they have to kind of assess what they can do. They have to scope their, their, their opportunities for ambition. So rather than before where, where they were kind of fielding, oh, you should do this, you should do that, when there's no kind of inherent sort of calling of the question, now there's this sort of demand driver from the Paris Agreement that sets up an opportunity or a kind of at least a conversation between the governments and their respective analytical communities about how they can proceed, not only on the national target setting, but frankly on all of those uh, five areas that I mentioned before. So it turns out there's a lot of questions that governments have. And this is just, this is based on, you know, partly my, my discussions with people, partly on, on my experience having done some of this when I was uh, at the White House working with, with the team on how we would do our engagement, uh, looking at what other countries needed to do. Um, but there are, frankly, a lot of questions that governments cannot easily answer on their own. Now, I will say, um, you know, the United States has a pretty good capacity to do some of this work internally. Like there's, for example, EIA uh, has a lot of capacity. The Department of Energy has a lot of capacity. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency has a lot of capacity to answer some of the questions that need to be answered about these Paris Agreement questions. But frankly, even the United States, I have to say, like even, if, even for us it was tough to come up with the right strategy, the right numbers. Um, and looking around at other countries, a lot of times they're, you know, it is very, very thin. Like they, they were able to do it, but, but they're, I think this is globally recognized that there was kind of a capacity constraint in doing this first round. That doesn't mean that the targets that, that every country set forth were, were not well informed because many of them were, but there was kind of a, a crunch for a capacity to understand how to do these, uh, these, these um, assessments uh, in the roughly year in advance of Paris, and that continues frankly, to today. Here's just a, a kind of small set of questions, like how do you think about those future opportunities? Well, in this room, if we tried to do that, we could come up with some things, right? You've got some models, you think about marginal abatement costs, you've got different kinds of modeling approaches to scope ambition, but again, not every country has that uh, right at hand. How do you do scenario building for these long-term low carbon uh, decarbonization pathways? Like how do you think about what ought to go into that long-term strategy. How do you compare targets across countries? This is an interesting research area for us, but it's not something that every country has kind of inherent capacity to do. How do you assess aggregate targets? How do you implement current commitments? How do you understand and up update national trajectories based on current implementation? How do you assess and compare current efforts across countries? And how do you do things like adaptation? How do you understand finance and how that influences some of these issues about implementation as well? And now, I'm not going to talk about the answers to all of these questions in the talk today, but I want to put them up here to demonstrate that if you think about what governments are designed to do, they're not designed to do these things. They're not designed to understand these questions. That is okay. 
You know, they have other functions that they have to do. But the point is they need to know the answers to these questions to make the right decisions about how they're going to engage with these five elements of the Paris Ambition Platform that I put up uh, in the first section. Okay? And that's kind of the core of what, what we need to think about then, because we're really not, uh, not fully, I think globally, we're definitely not, not ramped up to really be able to do a lot of this stuff. Um, this is where the, the research community, this is our community, this is where we come in, um, that we have to do better in terms of thinking about what we can do, uh, both in terms of our own domestic situation, but also thinking about how we can build the community of capacity to do these uh, this very important work on a very short timeline, uh, not only here in the United States, but also in countries uh, around the world. Now, I've made a cartoon here showing research and analytics and how they're linked, frankly, very deeply into most, if not all, frankly, of the elements of this engine of ambition that I, that I kind of cartoon thing that I, that I put up earlier. And if you think about each of those elements, you can think about why research and why people who understand uh, the technology, the science, how to do the data, how to do the data aggregation, thinking about the economics, uh, thinking about how to compare, all of those things come into play very deeply as countries are trying to figure out what they're going to do as part of the cycle of ambition. Um, let's see if I can get the next one. And so this is where I uh, sort of put, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I put it centrally because I'm, I'm a little biased that way. But, but I think that we, let's, let's realize, I think, where, where there is a need, and that is the research community right here. That this is an area where um, we haven't been thinking of ourselves as being so central to this process, but ultimately there is a core need for building out our capacity to do this kind of work. Um, it's different from publishing academic papers only, and I'll get to that later. There's a kind of different dimension of how I think this needs to happen, and uh, we'll talk about that uh, soon. But I just want to say this is where I think um, the, the need for broader research is, is, is very clear, and how, to, how we do that is really the question that I want us to start thinking about um, today. So let's talk about in a little bit more depth what each of those demand drivers is and then think about what the kind of role of the research community might be. So I've mentioned these demand drivers uh, uh, once earlier, but let me kind of run through them again. So we have this demand driver, what do governments really need out of this process, right? So they have a lot of other kind of consultations with stakeholders they're going to be doing. There's a lot of politics that governments have to think about. There's like what's their regulatory, what's their legal constraint to do this or that. That's all well and good, and that's really not the core of what I want to talk about. But thinking about what do we need to know for the NDCs, for example. So this first demand driver is the national target setting process. Um, I'm showing here uh, the, the, uh, a photo from uh, the, the Obama and Xi joint announcement of both countries' uh, national targets, which happened in November of 2014. Um, and it was this moment that the Paris Agreement, in my view, became real. Uh, it was this moment that, that uh, it, was, it was something that we were working on very hard. Uh, the, 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 you know, it, it, I think everybody was happy it all, uh, it all landed and, and, and worked well in two countries, the world's number one and number two emitter, a developed and developing country leader, came forward and, and basically said, we are uh, jointly uh, going to make this Paris thing work, and we representing 40% of global emissions um, are giving both our ambitious nationally determined contributions, at that time intended nationally determined contributions, and then at that point, it became clear that this was going to potentially be something. And that's what I would assert. People can dis dispute this. But I think that's where it became crystal clear, because I think at that point, uh, having been in touch with a number of other countries, that is when they started panicking, right, and saying, the US and China have done something. They picked up the phone and they called their national champion university researchers and they said, what can we do? Right? Like We need to come up with something fast. And it, it happened a little bit ahead of the game where people were expecting. So this, to me, was a very interesting moment, not only because of what it led to in terms of the global outcome, but also thinking about that process of what do governments do when they need to find their target. And what they ended up doing was, again, calling their national research capacity. Because a lot of them, remember, aren't the US of A, and they don't have big teams of, of modelers and researchers internally. They have people at the University of X, right, who have kind of done some work in this or spent some time here or there 
doing some modeling work. And so they, they can call out, this is not all countries, but a lot of countries rely on this kind of distributed model of expertise, where the expertise resides often in the universities. So they would often call the universities. So that's kind of a moment that we can remember and think about what was, um, what was the kind of process that happened there. And I would say, and I'm going to go quickly through this, um, this idea that each country has its own different kind of nationally determined contribution is another element of the Paris process. There's not sort of standardization of every country has a specific kind of target. Don't, don't spend too much time sort of worrying about the individual details here. The point being the thesis of this is that they're all different. And they, a lot of them look pretty different from each other. The US was a, uh, a, an, an absolute target below a 2005 level of 26 to 28% below. Um, but there's a lot of other kinds. Like uh, China had a, a sort of multi-part target. So part of it was like 20% non-fossil um, by, uh, by 2030 and a peak before 2030, these kinds of things. And so these ambition, this ambition mechanism looks very different in different countries. And so it had the, the expertise um, also has to sort of reflect what those national uh, priorities and circumstances would be. So this is, this is what the US national target looks like graphically. Um, and I'm, I'm actually not going to spend a lot of time on it because I don't think we need to or I don't think I have enough time. But, um, but just to show that this was um, a, a target that, that changed the pace of our decarbonization. And of course, now uh, I should just sort of say, look, this with, with, with Donald Trump's decision to kind of uh, change the US approach to climate change, uh, there's a whole other discussion about how we could potentially meet uh, that target or get back to that target, but I'll save that for, uh, for later. There is another question, not only of what countries can do, but what do, the what do the NDCs deliver in aggregate? And there are many, many ways to look at this. And again, the thesis of this slide is that these are three different research groups, all of which are kind of trying to kind of help inform that global conversation about where we get from the NDCs and how we draw a path from the NDCs to a two degree world. So it's a different problem of sort of you know, compared to what can the US do in 2025 to are these NDCs in aggregate getting us to the right place where we need to be in order to hit a two degree or even 1.5 degree path. Okay, so there's a whole other set of expertise and research that goes into that. Here's a second demand driver, uh, the long-term low carbon development strategy and sometimes called the long-term strategy or LTS. I'll give you an example from the United States because there haven't been that many countries who have actually delivered one. This one was of course delivered under the previous administration, not the current administration. Um, but what the, the US mid-century strategy asserts, which is in line with the science, is that for the United States, we would have to hit a target of, or a, a, a zone of roughly 80% uh, reductions below two, 2025 levels by 2050. Okay, so that's a, a, a major drop in, in just sort of 30, uh, 33 years from now. Um, you can see where our US national target was along that pathway. And uh, note it's basically a straight line path. Uh, but that doesn't mean that all the national targets would end up being on that straight line. But that's uh, one possible way to get there. The point there is that there's a dramatic and rapid decarbonization that would have to happen. I don't need to kind of tell the people in this room that that's a pretty aggressive, uh, a pretty aggressive strategy. And you know, there's a, a couple of ways to think about what that would look like. Here's part of the mid-century strategy report, and I'm, I'm actually not going to have time to walk through all the interesting details here. But if you just take, for example, this band here, which is the transform the energy system. Okay. It's only one part of the whole decarbonization strategy, like just a small order, right? Transform the energy system by 2050. But what you can see here is the combination, and this is according to one analysis, the combination of how you'd have to think about uh, combining energy efficiency strategies with decarbonization of electricity system, um, and then fuel switching for certain applications in order to get from here to there. But then also noting, you have to combine that with all this other stuff. You have to combine it with thinking about the land use sector, and of course, non-CO2 reductions as well, like HFCs. So that's kind of part of what has to go into a long-term strategy. You can, you can see just from looking at this and from probably from your own work, that this kind of effort takes some significant discussion between the policymakers and the analysts about how to do these scenarios. What do you kind of put in? What do you leave out? How do you choose a strategy to just do the analytics part of it? But nevertheless, um, this is sort of in, in, you know, kind of underscoring the, the, the deep level of effort that has to be undertaken to, to get there. Um, 
Now, for those of you who are wondering what exactly this implies on a kind of you know, year to year basis. Uh, here's your, here's the graphic for you. Um, this is kind of, and, and again, it's a little bit of a clunky graphic in the report, but it's, it's helpful to look at. Um, what you're seeing here is the, the, the build of, of each technology and the colors represent different technologies. Um, solar and wind are these kind of lighter colored uh, areas there. So on the left, you have a historical record. And on the right, you have, look, if we're going to hit our mid-century strategy goals, this is, again, remember something that's kind of required or asked for by the Paris Agreement is a demand driver for how countries think about their strategies. You, you can see here in the US example, um, there's you know, uh, 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 the pace of, of, of deployment in the last couple of years is only about 2 thirds of what would be needed uh, for the next roughly uh, uh, roughly 20 years, and then beyond that, you can see uh, the pace is even higher, um, and that is ambitious. We can have a discussion about whether that can happen or not, but it is ambitious. Uh, that was sort of implied by what we would need to do in order to hit our science-based targets. Um, and that's part of the U.S. mid-century strategy, and that's where this Paris Agreement demand driver comes in, because it actually helps the countries say, look, okay, if we're going to do this, this is a tall order. And how might we actually start that process now, given that the, the analysis tells us we've got to actually get going, uh, essentially today, uh, deploying those technologies at a rapid rate, and frankly, a rate that has been more rapid than we've seen uh, even recently. And the final thing that I'll, I'll say about long-term strategies, for those of you who have done this kind of analytical work with modeling and, and sort of looking at uh, the opportunities for countries or for the globe to do certain things, uh, like I said before, what is and isn't included in the different scenarios is a key element. And the, and the analysts will always tell you, and some of you have done this, that it's kind of in some ways not your job to make the decisions about what's included and not included. It's sort of for the policy community. Like, what do you want to include? How do you want to sort of think about land sector in this long-term decarbonization strategy? You tell us, and then we can help. So part of this is actually building out um, the strategies together. Um, transparency is another one in the Paris Agreement. Um, I think I'm going to go through this a little more quickly because I explained it a little before. But the point here is that there's going to be some requirement for countries to be reporting out. They'll have to look at their, um, their inventories. Again, this is something we have capacity in the US to do. Uh, but that there will be some engagement uh, from, from uh, analysts and, and people who are looking at how to aggregate and combine data. Um, so we'll have to build out the, the, the strategies for that. There's a fourth demand driver that I haven't mentioned yet, but is important, and it's turned out to be one that's, that's um, of course, was designed to be important, but has become quite interesting uh, to many of the countries that are participating in this, this international climate process, and that's the sustainable development goals. Uh, this, the SDGs were designed to be the sort of next step in global thinking about how we're going to be organizing our our, structure, our, our strategies for development, um, both for, for economic development countries, but also now uh, for sustainability and climate. And because of the sustainable development goals, um, it's actually interesting. The Paris Agreement is actually, because it's called the question on national strategies and long-term strategies, there's now a movement to integrate the SDGs into these national planning processes as well. So that was kind of a, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a totally unintended consequence or outcome, uh, but it wasn't sort of core to what was designed in Paris. But I think it's an interesting um, and helpful uh, sort of next step that the SDGs are now being incorporated more directly in conversations. And of course, that requires, again, the engagement of the communities that understand how the policies will, impl will impact across these different, um, these 17 different goals, um, some of which are very clearly linked to energy and climate, like uh, SDG 7, um, but all of them. Uh, have some some uh, sort of you know these are all interlinked and I think that's the point of making them uh, uh, sort of set together. Okay, so let's see if I can get to the next one. Um, actually, this was this was the point I was just making that um, when you think about the SDGs and their uh, in interactions with these other processes. Sorry, I'm I'm, I'm repeating the the the. Oh, I, I I clicked the clicker too many times. Um, there we go. Um, so if you think about each of these processes as being a sort of cyclical process, there's now this opportunity to kind of do cross linkages across the different ones. So I'm, I'm just going to move on. Um, two more demand drivers, and I'll do these in, in short succession, three more demand drivers, actually. So one is 
quite relevant to the, to the US right now. So the US right now, we're, we're dealing with this sort of situation where Donald Trump has pulled out of the Paris Agreement, but there's a lot of countries, or sorry, a lot of co uh, counties, cities, and states who are wanting to do more. And so it's, it's another question of how to engage uh, these cities, states, and subnational entities, and how we understand how their commitments can actually aggregate together uh, to make something. So that's another area where um, the analytical community can, can come in. So one of the interesting factoids here is that the, the cities and states that have uh, committed to doing something about climate change represent essentially the third largest uh, economy globally. And how to think about the impact of that with respect to these Paris climate goals is a final or is another element of the, um, of the process. Um, there are two more brief ones. This so-called Talanoa Dialogue is this um, repeated process that Paris sets up to assess how well countries are doing toward those long-term targets. And then the final one is the continued engagement of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, which will be a final element that the research community can be involved in. So the, the final piece that I want to say today is to think about this new relationship. I've, I've sort of outlined these, these demand drivers that we have this different relationship between the policy community and what they need from the research community at this point. Um, so at this point, we have to think about, well, what is that actually going to look like? Um, we, we know that we have to advance the field. We know we have to understand this ambition cycle. We know we have to more tightly integrate these analytical communities with policy decision structures. Um, and that we know that we have to accelerate the pace of research to line it up with the policy cycles. Those are things that are kind of well-known issues sometimes with the science policy interface. But now, again, we have this, this kind of more direct uh, calling of the question. A final element that is part of Paris that I think we should also be aware of is that new entrants, this idea that there's not enough global capacity and it cannot all reside in the elite universities of the world, that there has to be some broad-based engagement that goes beyond just the kind of uh, global publishing elites that would pull in uh, these new entrants. So I kind of think about this in, in, in with, with twin goals. So first of all, the, the first goal to kind of get at this problem is to build a community of expertise and integrate this with uh, the government and broader stakeholder groups. And then we, in doing so, provide input to these demand-driven processes. Um, and really, right now, it's, it's, a, it's a question of how we, how we can actually accomplish this. There's already a number of groups out there that are thinking about how to do this. And I'm going to say that these are very helpful, but there's still some gaps that we need to think about. I put up one here that's called the NDC Partnership. There's one that's called the 2050 Pathways Platform, the Climate and Development Knowledge Network, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. There's an a interesting integrative modeling exercise being run out of EASA called the World in 2050. There's America's Pledge, which is focusing on the state, subnational, and city action in the United States. Um, and then finally, there's the Climate Collab here at here at MIT is another way to kind of get at, get at, these, uh, get at these issues. So all of these represent different models. I, I am sorry I don't have time to run through why all of them are interesting. But I want to say there's a lot of work that's already being done and has been done on how to get these, these communities to interact better. But I will also assert that I don't think we're, we're, we're not there yet. When I look at the kind of global capacity that's going to be needed, there's, there's a lot of, like I, I think we're only about a tenth of where we will need to be in order to get this process done right. And I think if we think about our role as sort of analysts or researchers, we have a number of constraints because of partly our institutions. There's constraints because of kind of how academic institutions are structured. There's constraints about um, how, you know, kind of global processes that are brokered under the UN are structured. And of course, there's constraints that come in because of national policy making. Um, I've lumped them into three kind of broad groups, the thing about existing incentives, funding, and organizational work. Um, there's other ways to cut the pie, but, but basically there's still a number of challenges um, that I think we can, we can start to work through. So today, I think what I, what I want to kind of leave us with is thinking about what are the creative ways we can uh, make a contribution? How can we as a community of analysts, community of experts, uh, make a contribution in our own spheres, but also help with this thinking about going beyond those constraints? So one element that's important is thinking about how do you co-produce these sustainable development pathways. I talked about that before, the scenario development, the choice of modeling approach, the other techniques. How do you establish broad processes to, to set goal for near-term targets? So this is another area where we can 
um, we can contribute in terms of thinking about how that process might work better or, or not as well. We can organize the research community to integrate with existing programs and initiatives. So this is, again, thinking about how we go beyond the kind of elite university organizational structure, how you pull in new entrants. Um, doing a culture of open review. This is something that isn't sort of as, as common in the government world, but we can sort of help with that process of what I called transparency before. This is something that we, frankly, do well. This is part of how we do our work in, in the research community. And I think there are good practices that could be borrowed from that community to go into that process of assessment, review, and transparency that, that are needed to, to make this process work. Um, partnerships between not only the research community itself, like between different institutions, but also with funders, international organizations, and governments. And this is where it becomes an organizational challenge. But it's very clear that the funding levels aren't there that we need them to be. So we need to bring funders into this. We need to think about how these projects can be done better. Um, and of course, making sure that the governments and other organizations are fully uh, integrated. And finally, and I have to say not least, because all of you who've worked in universities know that I'm sort of asking for the moon here, but um, provide new incentive structures within universities to support contributions to this process. Because ultimately, um, while peer review publications are very important, will always remain the bread and butter of our, of our work, um, there, there, there ought to be some engagement by universities and our research organizations that allows some more flexibility in terms of what counts as a positive contribution uh, in our research field. And I think I don't, you know, that's a longer conversation of what constitutes good versus not good in that area. Um, that's not an easy conversation to have, but I think we ought to have that conversation so that people who are engaging in that process uh, can do so from, uh, from the institutional setting that they're, they're based in. Um, so those are some, some initial ideas that, um, that I'd like to put forward. There's, there's a lot of interesting actions that I think are going to be happening over the next year, not least thinking about how we organize work within the United States under America's pledge, and also thinking about how we organize toward next year's uh, Secretary General Summit and this Talanoa Dialogue, thinking about the next stock take, about how well we're doing and what we can do better. Um, because of that, I think the next two years are critical. Uh, for a successful first round, and the successful first round under Paris uh, will be, I think, a really important step to make sure Paris actually delivers uh, on what we want it to. Um, so with that, I'm going to conclude, say thanks very much, and I'm happy to take some questions. OK, so we have time for questions. Any questions from the audience? Yes. So a piece that seemed to me to be missing from the research deals with the issue of how you actually successfully implement policies in the United States. Most of its history, the government of the United States has been responsible, responsive to financial, mercantile, and corporate interests. When you do major changes in infrastructure, there tend to be winners and losers. And the losers tend to be the established companies that have most of the lobbying power. So for example, I think Obama's clean power plant, power plan, might have been better received if on the day it was announced, they submitted a bill to Congress saying, we're going to spend a billion dollars building solar panel plants in Kentucky and give the ownership of those to the coal companies in Kentucky, and another billion doing turbine factories in Wyoming and give that to the coal companies of Wyoming as a gift from the people of the US. So how do you see the issue of how you make your policies actually happen in a country that's dominated by corporate interests that will have losers? Yeah. Well, that is a very good question. And uh, that's, that's kind of one of the questions that we're struggling. You know, we have been struggling. We, the everybody, not just the US, have, have been thinking about and struggling with with this whole question of transforming the energy system, right? The kind of fundamental element of that mid-century strategy that I that I put up there, which is not my work, by the way. That's uh, a work, a group I was affiliated with, but but I'm claiming no credit for. Um, th but that is it's an interesting piece of work. Um, your question gets at uh, what what I would call you know kind of, we could call it different things, but political economy or politics or, or whatever. I I wasn't. That was sort of an issue I kind of sidestepped in this particular talk, um, mostly because I wanted to get this other thesis up there. But you, you raise a really important question about how effective policy can be in doing the work that needs to be done to get 
to this two degree pathway. And I think there's been raised in a couple of other fields. Some people, for example, say there's going to be a political constraint to raising the carbon price beyond you know, X level. Because once you raise it beyond X level, you're going to have revolt in the streets, right? That there's some kind of inherent back pressure that you get from politics. And any country that has its own ability to govern itself and vote will just not tolerate that a sort of super high level of a carbon tax for more than one election cycle. And then they'll kick everybody out and undo it. Right? So there's kind of a, there's this politics or political economy argument in there. I don't, ha I don't have a, a, a sort of one shot or single solution to that. Um, but I do think that thinking about multiple dimensions, like multiple sectors simultaneously, as well as thinking about the very important element of driving technology costs down uh, is part of the bootstrapping that you get out of this kind of cycle of ambition, that you, I, you, know, you kind of keep the pressure up at each cycle to the point that it's like, painful but not so painful that it all collapses, right? You drive down the technology cost during that cycle, and then you go to the sort of same painful level the next, I shouldn't use that word, the same level of ambition uh, the next round, and then you can sort of up the, uh, up the, uh, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the deployment of the technology in the next round. So maybe that's enough for, for now, but I'm happy to, to chat more about that later. I, I saw another couple of hands. The gentleman so. with the microphone. Yeah, hi. Um, discussing the long-term solution, like mm -hmm. 2050, um, former Secretary Muniz gave a very nice review last week showing that you'll have efficiency, renewables, maybe a breakthrough in storage, which is market-driven and can be also facilitated through subsidies. Um, but the long-term uh, objectives are kind of, you, I will have to include nuclear. Now, a, a month ago, uh, there was uh, the lady from the uh, DOE showing that the US is intending on that's the DOE data, phasing out nuclear energy between 2030 and 2050, mostly replacing it with natural gas. Mm -hmm. So how do you account for this kind of mismatch between the needs and the predictions by the DOE regarding nuclear with all the public attitude and finance challenges? And the other, one, the other thing is, do you also consider uh, solutions on the side of consumptions like phasing out a global campaign maybe to phase out meat consumption, which is mm -hmm. responsible mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. a lot yeah. of emissions? Yeah. Um, let me, let me, because of time, I'm going to try to do a little more rapid fire answers here. So, so on the, um, the first question of nuclear, um, I think that it's, you know, nuclear is a complicated technology. I've done some work on nuclear myself um, as nuclear policy. Um, look, it's likely we're going to need all the help we can get to get on that two degree pathway. And so, um, you know, in those places where, we're confident that nuclear can be done, done at low cost. I think that's a that's a kind of good option. Um, you know, one of the questions that always arises is the relative costs of the technologies, and I think that's the the core question that I have is what does the technology cost um, uh, opportunity set look like in 2030 with sort of very low cost renewables, but also nuclear still as a mature technology. Um, that's a longer conversation to have about where we think they're going to go. But I don't think there's a reason to exclude nuclear kind of a priori from, from the possibility set. Uh, your second question briefly was on other things like behavioral changes and, and meat consumption. A lot of people are talking about that. I think that that's, uh, that's a good conversation to have. And I think that's uh, something about thinking about. Uh, certainly in this country, we, we have some choices we can make about if not sort of going all vegan or something, but people can certainly make some choices that might be uh, you know, healthier for them, if it's a personal choice, but also kind of have positive effects for, uh, for climate. So I think I'm, I'm happy we're having that conversation, but I think it's, it's going to be always tricky because it's about a personal choice, a personal behavior um, to, to, to think about changing. We have two questions down here. Okay. Maybe we'll take both questions at one time, or batch them. Uh, thanks. Here's a wide open question. Mm -hmm. um, having been involved in negotiations and, and work all around the world, what's something that uh, people from the United States, who often are sort of blinded mm -hmm. <laughs> to the way we do things here, what's something about the, the way these conversations work in other countries that we might want to know or, or keep in mind? Yeah, good question. Should we take the second one here? Thank you. So I just want to ask, maybe UIT states, like many like, developed countries, have the technology to achieve those goals that you guys set. But like in terms of developing countries, when they want to make their own contribution, intended contribution, they need to take a, like, in the like, international like, aid, like, technology transfer into account. So do you know how do they like, acquire those confidence level of like, you know, 
international transfer, like technology transfer or finance, like in, mm -hmm. in terms of their future projection or um, yeah. plans? Thanks. Um, so what, th is the question what works well in other places that's not working here, or is it what do people not understand about our system that the they, former. okay, okay. Um, well, I mean, okay, so that's a great question. Thank you for, for those, both of those questions. Um, uh, I mean, look, I, you know, in a way, I, I feel like we have our system here, and there's, there's you know, we have, a, we have a kind of fraught system. We have a system that's, it's, it's one of those things where it's on the one hand, on the other hand. We, we have had a longstanding, uneasy relationship with expertise in this country, right? There's just kind of, it's, it's been kind of back and forth and it's, it's kind of a pervasive historical issue in the United States. That's, you know, declaration of independence, right? Like there's this, sort of this, this kind of trait that, that, that comes up and sometimes it comes up in ways that are uh, pr frankly not as, as positive, right? That, that we sort of have this round of thinking about like that, you know, some, somehow there's two sides of the science of climate change, which there really are not. And, and so thinking about, you know, the, the kind of role of um, sort of expert input in the process is, does vary quite a bit across from our country to a lot of other countries. And I think that we always have to work with what we've got in our country. And I think that that's something that I want to embrace and sort of say, look, we've got to work with the way our country works. Um, but certainly in other countries, there, for example, there very few of any countries are still fighting the battle of is climate change happening. So I think that's something that, that would, uh, that does pr pr provide a constraint. It provides a, it's a big hindrance to kind of how fast we can move right now. Um, and then the other question um, was on how do other, as, as countries are thinking about technology, how do they take into account the possibilities of use or technology transfer? But I'm gonna broaden that a little bit to think about how um, the international community can support you know, development of new technologies in, in maybe countries that don't have a, uh, a lot of ability to finance internally or domestically. And so that was a really big part of Paris, thinking about how to finance, how to provide support for both adaptation, but also for new technologies. Um, and I think that there were a couple of uh, sort of positive things that came out of that. Uh, the US is not participating anymore in it, but there's some funding that's gonna be going to those countries to help them uh, develop these projects. Uh, your question was a little more on how they take that into consideration. And um, you know, frankly, I think that's something that they'll have to sort of, over this cycling of this process, they can sort of learn I think it was hard. It was hard to do that first round because it's really hard to know how much you're going to be able to get out of a process that hasn't actually landed yet. But I think in this next round there'll be a lot more kind of interaction between the various parties, uh, the, the financing organizations, as, and and the um, and the countries themselves to enable them to get a, maybe a better handle on what they can do. Yeah. We have time for I think two more questions. So we have one here, and then we'll take two at the same time. So if you can pass it down to your right, down one row. Um, hi, you showed in your presentation a, a diagram that had significant growth in the next 15 years before 2030 and a bunch of different ways to limit the emissions associated with that growth. Of course, after 2030, we expect growth to continue and as we get past some of the low hanging fruit in ways to mitigate carbon, it might be more difficult to mitigate the emissions associated with future growth. Um, I know that all countries are hungry to hungry for economic growth. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we can do to foster a engine of ambition around lip, like putting an inflection on that growth trend, or at least the emissions associated mm -hmm. with it? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, when, when something when something is made in China and sold here, um, the emissions are credited to China, I guess. But is there some talk about? if the consumer should be responsible for some of the emissions yeah. and some sort of a cross transfer? Yeah. Um, so let me, take, uh, let me take this question first. Uh, there, there has been a lot of, um, and thank you for both questions. Uh, there has been, um, this has been a historical problem that's come up about where are the emissions created for something that's manufactured in country X? Well, we know, we know where they're created. If they're created in country X, but then exported to country Y, uh, y you know, how, how does that work in terms of who's responsible for the emissions? Um, it's, it's, you know, look, it's not something I study fundamentally myself, but I've actually talked to a lot of people who, who wrestle with this, and there's, there's a couple of ways to look at this. One is just the way we do things now, which you, people may or may not like, but the way that things are done now is that the accounting happens in the place that it's emitted. And frankly, the, the challenge is 
how to come up with, if somebody wants to do something differently, how do you come up with a better accounting system than that? Because it's all about how do you draw the boundaries and how do you do the kind of analysis of where emissions begin and end. And that's a, an analytically challenging problem. And it's much more challenging than just saying where the emissions happen and that's where it's, it's registered. So there's kind of a practical dimension to that problem. It may not be the ethically correct way to think about it. I mean, I think there's two answers to that. The other way to think about it is that if you had a world where there was actually taxation or something like that happening, that first of all, um, if there's kind of a, it depends on how differential the taxation is, but there's a way that their country X might be getting compensated, right, for some of that, uh, some of the emissions that are happening, right? So in other words, they're getting, it's part of the trade that happens that you could imagine. And again, I'm not saying one way or the other is the correct way ethically to think about it, but you are having a transaction. And when you're having a transaction, there's sort of a, a mutual agreement that that's, that's something that's beneficial to both parties. So one of the arguments too is that there's a compensation for those emissions. Um, but anyway, complicated topic and very good one. And I think is an ongoing sort of research area that people continue to struggle with. On the question of inflection points, um, you know, you, you, that's precisely the question, right? Like we do want to have, it's not just a question of we need to you know, reduce emissions at, at, at all costs. It's the question of we need to reduce emissions and we need to do other stuff too. It's like walking and chewing gum at the same time. You got to reduce emissions. You got to allow for economic growth. You got to account for kind of enhancement of all the sustainable development goals, right? All the kind of development goals that we've had for the global community, you know, reduction in poverty, improvement in health, and um, increased job, you know, numbers of jobs and employment for everybody. So, so it's this kind of multi-part optimization where you're trying to actually do the emission stuff, and we focused on that in the talk today, but mindful that all these other things have to, ha have to be happening for countries to actually embrace the strategy, right? They can't just embrace a de decarbonizing strategy and ignore their jobs problems or ignore their, you know, their health problems. So um, that's, a, that's a fundamental question. And here again, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a challenge and it's really not something I think I have the sole answer to or the single answer to, but you know, ultimately we do have to think about what's the, it's kind of a, it's this dovetailing, it really gets back to our engine of ambition question, the dovetailing of what can we do as our next step, right? How fast, how far can we you know, convince ourselves we can go in the next step? And then we globally do the deployment and then work on very significantly and seriously the technologies that will enable us to do it more cheaply and better in the next round. And I think that there's, there's I have confidence we can do that. I think we are an innovative, you know, here in this institution, it's an innovative institution. In this country, we can be innovative. Globally, we can be innovative. If we put the right incentives in place, we make the right uh, strides, and we kind of continue to do the deployment, we can start to see these, these costs uh, reduced. We've already started on that path. We're already partway down the path, and we just have to keep doing what we know will work. So that's where I think I'll, I'll end it and say thanks, everybody, for the, the questions. Yeah. Thank you.